A little over two months ago, I made this video detailing all of the things I deemed as important if you were to start your first Dragon Age run. In the same video, I also promised to make a similar video for Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition. So, yeah, here we are. I wish it was as simple as telling you they took Dragon Age Origins, copy and pasted it and slapped the 2 on the cover instead of the Origins logo, but unfortunately, that's not the case. So, let's take a look at what changed, what hasn't and what you can expect. We will, just as in the Origins video, discuss the story setup, core gameplay mechanics, party setups, tactics, and some other stuff here and there like tips and things to avoid. Let's get started with a bit of lore and the story setup. How in Origins you are in complete control of your name, race, upbringing and reason as to why you became who you were. In Dragon Age 2 you play as either Gareth Hawk or Marion Hawk, a human being born in Amaranthine who has spent most of their life living in Lothring, the first village you visited in Dragon Age Origins. You can change your first name, but the surname Hawk is predetermined, similar to how in the Mass Effect games, no matter what you call your character, everybody just calls you Shepard. The story starts off with you and your family running away from the Blight, leaving Lothring behind you with the dark spawn on your heels. Now, you might think another Blight? Isn't that the same story as Origins? And yeah, you're right, it is. Or to make matters worse, it's even the same Blight. You see, to put things on a timeline, we're currently in the 30th year of the 9th century, which, if you remember from the previous video, is a Dragon Age century. The start of Dragon Age 2 overlaps a part of the story of Origins. However, throughout the story Dragon Age 2, we'll get ahead a couple of years compared to Origins, realizing that Ferelden will probably be lost soon, unaware of the fact that the Warden and Alistair have just started their journey to try and unite it, the Hawk family leaves and heads to Kirkwall. Kirkwall is a city located in the southern part of the Free Marges. The ground Kirkwall was built upon was originally owned by barbarians, that is, until the Defensor Imperium took over and turned it into a proper city. Between then and current events, over 1500 years have passed and dozens of noteworthy historical events have taken place, which we are obviously not going to cover in this video. It now holds many inhabitants, including a lot of Qunari, who aren't really welcome there to say the least. They'll play a major role in the story, however, I cannot share why, as that would spoil half of the story. Nine years prior to your arrival, Viscount Perrin Trenholt attempted to destroy the Templar Order, resulting in the death of Knight Commander Gillian. The Viscount was overthrown by Meredith. For her heroic actions, she was named the new Knight Commander by Grand Cleric Althena, resulting in the Templar Order having the full support of the Chantry in Kirkwall. You can imagine the importance of this, as the Chantry is the main religious organization in Thedas. It would be comparable to having the Christian Pope having your back during the Middle Ages. This is relevant as Meredith will play a huge role in the story later on. Ever since the events in the Mage Tower in Dragon Age Origins, relationships between Mages and Templars have hit an all-time low. These matters will only worsen in Dragon Age 2. In 928 of the Dragon Age, First Enchanter Maseron died without a successor. Due to bad relationships between Templars and Mages, Meredith claimed there was no need for a First Enchanter in Kirkwall at all. However, seeing as to how this would most likely lead to the Templars overrunning the mages, an elven mage named Orsino stepped up and volunteered, becoming the youngest first enchanter ever known, at least in Kirkwall's history. He will also play a major role in the story. Dragon Age Asunder, the third entry in the series of books, vividly goes into detail about what happened after all of these events. However, I would advise reading it after at least one playthrough of Dragon Age 2, as it might spoil some of the story. Speaking of stories, the arrival in 930 of the Dragon Age is where your story kicks off. The game does an excellent job explaining what you're going to be doing and why that's even important at all, as you're a pre-made character and the entire story is built around, well, your character. So let's save any type of spoilers and opinions and head straight to the gameplay now. The first thing you'll notice when booting up Dragon Age 2 is that the gameplay is a lot quicker than Dragon Age Origins. How Dragon Age Origins was more of a tactics based checkersboard type of gameplay, carefully constructing builds and setting up party combinations, Dragon Age 2 plays a lot more like a typical MMORPG. It will throw wave after wave of low HP, low damage dealing enemies your way, and it's your job to hack and slash your way through them as quickly as possible. How in Origins you wanted to take your time, in Dragon Age 2 you want to get the job done quick before the enemies get a chance to pile up and kill you. Difficulty settings are exactly the same as well. The AI does not become smarter, nor better, they just multiply and get extra stats and buffs that you do not get. There are also zero achievements linked to the higher difficulty settings, so there's no reason to choose these except for the fact that you might just like the challenge. 
The one and only noticeable change is that now friendly fire is turned off, with no option to turn it on except for when you play on nightmare difficulty. Starting classes are mages, warriors and rogues. Unlike Origins, the warriors in Dragon Age 2 are actually, well, fun to play. They fly through the battlefield and have more crowd control abilities, making them less of a chore to play. Attacking enemies out of range will result in them teleporting towards them, so you won't have to stand right next to them before attacking. Playing multiple warriors in one party now works pretty well actually. The overall damage output will be a lot lower, but at least you won't be dying anytime soon. The same can be said for rogues, as they now finally fight like they're supposed to, rolling and jumping from enemy to enemy with flashy moves. They've learned some new abilities, including very decent crowd control ones, however, neither of them can match the damage output and the crowd controlling abilities of the mage. Mages are, and will always, remain the main force to be reckoned with in the party, as they buff and heal friendlies, but also destroy and incapacitate enemy forces. After choosing your class, you can choose a preset option representing everything that has happened in Origins, or just import one of your save files from Origin itself. Hopefully you left on good terms with your Origins party and left most of the important story characters alive, as they will make a return in Dragon Age 2, and some of them even in Inquisition. This does automatically bring me to two of Dragon Age 2's best mechanics, and in my opinion, two that often get overlooked when making games. The friendship slash rivalry system and cross-class combinations. As you might remember from Origins, if a character didn't like you, well, that was kinda the end of your interactions with that person, and if you really messed up, they would even leave your party. Dragon Age 2, you can also make sure a party member hates your guts, just like in Origins. However, they will not leave, they will just build up a rivalry with you. To make it even cooler, this also works for the romance options, resulting in some pretty unique dialogue. Role-playing aspects aside, depending on how you want to build party members, they get unique abilities depending on if they're your friend or your rival. Gone are the days of picking the dialogue option that you think would please someone the most out of fear they might otherwise get pissed off. It may be wise to check beforehand if you like the friendship or rivalry abilities better. However, for role-playing purposes it may ruin your playthrough if at the end of the game everybody dislikes you. Cross-class combinations are essentially follow-up attacks to attacks already performed by another party member. If you freeze something and then hit them with say a pommel attack or a disorienting shot, it will not only stack damage but also do a bonus form of damage to the enemy. An example. A warrior shield bashes an enemy, leaving them staggered. A staggered enemy does 25% less damage and has 25% less damage defense. Normally attacking this character with a rogue member would do simply 100% attack damage, assuming no abilities or items are increasing the rogue's damage output. However, now that they're stunned, hitting the same enemy with an say explosive strike will do 300% damage, meaning an overall 200% increase compared to a regular attack. Using the example of the staggered enemy once again, the same would go for a chain lightning attack from a mage. Instead of normal damage, it now does 300% total. Only warriors can leave enemies staggered. However, rogues can disorient, reducing enemies defense by 50% and mages can brittle increasing the critical damage an enemy can receive by 50%. Keep in mind that cross-class attacking does not stack, meaning that hitting a staggered enemy with 5 different follow-up attacks doesn't completely decimate them. Only the first attack will deal additional damage or cause a status effect. You'll also notice damage numbers flying all over the screen. They do nothing but show you what type of damage you're exactly doing. Light green means healing, white is physical damage, dark green is nature damage, Orange is fire damage, yellow is lightning damage, blue is ice slash freeze damage, and purple is spirit damage. A quick example, here the entire party does physical damage, as you can see from the white numbers, with just a bit of purple thrown in between. That purple is being caused by the staff of our mage. These numbers can be toggled on or off via the gameplay menu. There's no way to inspect whether a target is viable to the damage you're doing except for looking it up on the internet or by trial and error. So. At first you'll have no clue if something or someone is susceptible to fire damage, ice damage, spirit damage. You don't really know. But truth be told, having this knowledge won't be a major game changer whatsoever. You don't need to be a genius to figure out that if something does fire damage, hitting them with ice abilities will hurt them a lot more than hitting them with, well, even more fire. Other than that, it's the same engine of Formula's Origins. Pause with the spacebar. Quick select members with F1 to F4, quick select abilities with 1 to 0, and use hotkeys like Ctrl plus A to select everyone at once, which is handy to quickly kill high priority targets. Tactics have been simplified a lot compared to Origins, however, due to the faster combat, the presets are a lot more noticeable. People who are put on aggressive will rush forward a lot more, 
and people who are defending will hang back a lot more. How in Origins everyone filled up a designated role in the party, you can honestly just kinda go crazy in Dragon Age 2, especially with the use of combos mentioned before. This does not mean put your dual wielding rogue on ranged or your mage on aggressive scrapper, but it's a whole lot harder now to mess up your party till the point where they become useless. Reason for this being the faster combat and overall increase of area of effect or AoE attacks, ensuring that aggressive gameplay is being punished a whole lot less. Speaking of parties, you will have a pretty small one in this game, so don't feel too burdened to try and create a hog that complements the rest of your group, you can kinda mismatch everything together, especially as the ability trees have been toned down a bunch as well. Specializations are still there and unlock automatically at level 7 or 14. There's no need to learn them from specific characters anymore, just reaching level 7 and 14 is the only requirement that needs to be met to start putting points into them. As always, a balanced party will still be the party of the same fighting type, at least for the first run. Other than that, the same principles still apply. Heal yourself when low on health by using potions or make the mage healer do it for you. Keep in mind that some abilities still counter each other out or don't stack. For example, Anders, one of your party members, has the vengeance mechanic, which ensures he cannot be healed. So if you would like him to heal himself when he's low on health, make sure the tactic Deactivate Vengeance is placed above health below, say 50%, use health on self. As friendly fire isn't really a thing anymore, you might as well use a lot of AoE attacks, especially when a warrior or rogue is being crowded. Jump the tactic would, in practice, be used if the requirement of a certain tactic isn't met, automatically activating the next tactic in line. However, from what I've gathered on the internet, this mechanic is still bugged, and I still found posts and articles only dating back a couple of years ago mentioning this issue, so in other words, it never really got fixed. With that being said, I would completely avoid the jump the tactic line and stick to the basics I mentioned before. Some stuff that does work though is combining certain tactic requirements. Enemy staggered, use current condition for next tactic. And down the next line, say enemy is below 75% health, use something like mighty blow. This means the enemy needs to be staggered and under 75% health for Hawk to hit them with the mighty blow. As Dragon Age 2 plays more like an action RPG anyways, you in general make a lot less use of the tactic system. It's not necessarily better or worse than Origins slow paced, more fleshed out system, it's just different and more focused on responsiveness and quick thinking instead of slowly but surely trying to figure the battle out. At the end of the day, crowd control is the name of the game, so I highly recommend using as many enemy is clustered followed by an AoE attacks as possible. With the talk about potions and healing yourself, you might have noticed in the gameplay that crafting is gone. As a matter of fact, all skills are gone including things like Persuasion, Stealth and Poisoning. Potions, Runes and Poison are now ordered via your home in Kirkwall, or via traders on the market. Simply bump into the required ingredients or buy them on the market, head to one of set locations and click on the items you wish to receive. While all of the potions can be ordered directly to your home, runes have to be embedded by Sandal, who you can find right here in the Hightown district. The same attributes as Origins are used in Dragon Age 2, and they all do essentially the same thing with some minor changes. Warrior damage output depends on strength, rogues dexterity and mages magic. On top of that, strength increases fortitude, which helps with preventing being knocked down and the damage status effects do. Dexterity increases critical hit damage and magic raises not only damage output from magic attacks, but also how resistant you are when you are being attacked by them. However, in Dragon Age 2, the likelihood to hit something depends on the class that you are and the amount of points contributed to it. What does that mean? The likeliness to hit something with a warrior depends on their strength, and for a rogue, on their dexterity. This means there's no reason whatsoever to put points into strength as a rogue or in dexterity as a warrior. So essentially, just as in Origins, I would personally recommend a bit more of a min-max approach, keeping the attributes meant for that character in line with the actual build. So once again, strength for the warrior, magic for a mage, etc. Cunning increases defense for all classes. How likely you are to critical hit something, and the level of locks and traps a rogue can open or dismantle. You can see it as a dodge mechanic. The higher it is, the more likely it is an attack directed at you will miss. Lock and trap levels are measured by every 10 points into cunning, meaning you are able to open the lowest level of locks at level 10, slowly increasing once you hit 20, 
30 and finally at level 40 you can essentially open every lock in the game. Hitting everything due to high dexterity is great, but if your critical chance sucks your overall damage is still pretty low. Willpower stayed the same, the more of it you have, the more stamina or mana you get. Last but not least, constitution. In my origins guide I noted how useless constitution is, so it's quite a relief to finally be able to tell you that at least in the sequel, constitution is finally still completely useless. No, alright, it, it's a bit better. As some warrior items and armor require a certain amount of it to wear the armor, but other than that, don't bother. Unless you have points to spare. As armor still outshines, getting 5 plus hit points for every level of constitution you increase. Damage is the amount of damage a regular attack with your weapon does to an enemy. However, this number doesn't mean much as it will constantly shift all over the place depending on the items you have equipped, but also the items your opponents have equipped. As their higher armor rating, but also higher cunning, will result in damage deflection and dodging. Attack is the likeliness of hitting something, which if you remembered correctly from a couple of minutes ago, gets increased by adding points to the category your character is in line with. So in this example that would be strength as I'm playing as a warrior. Defense increases attack deflection and how easily you dodge things, and armor is simply what you're wearing. In case you ever forgot, you can hover over the categories to get a quick summary. In case you ever forget one of these things, you can just hover over the categories in the character record to get a quick summary. You get access to this by pressing the C button while in-game. All in all, they simplified the hell out of this game compared to Origins. Whether that's good or bad, I'll leave that up to you to decide. <laughs> these are the biggest changes in Dragon Age 2. Other than that, it's the same engine gameplay setup and overall experience as Dragon Age Origins is. Dragon Age 2 released only two years after Origins, so essentially there was barely any room for the developers to change mechanics or to try and improve on things. If you're interested in a more fleshed out explanation of the abilities and talents, check out my Origins guide, as we in that video went over how to set up certain characters and make sure that they complement each other and that your build actually makes sense. As always, I would still like to end these videos with some tips and things that I personally experienced or learned in my multiple runs of this game. Number 1. Stop assuming that the fight is over. Dragon Age 2 uses a wave system, or in other words, whenever you think you're done, a new group of enemies will spawn out of nowhere and continue to attack you. And after that group, probably another one. And another. If you're like me and you like to completely overkill the last enemy with a big stamina or manning draining attack, you might want to keep that one in reserve as the fight may be far from over. Number 2. Injuries. Or actually, lack of injuries. Gone are the days of detailed injuries that all had a specific purpose and stat reducing effect. Now they just stack, and that stack results in less and less health. Injury kits are still a thing, however don't even bother using them, as traveling to your home automatically heals your party. So Hawk, but also all of your companions. Dragon Age 2 is much less of a dungeon crawler than Origins was, and as about 75% of the game is spent in Kirkwall, you can always just make a quick detour to your home, getting rid of all injuries. Of course, always having some on you whenever you leave the city would be handy, but if you're in the city, just go home. Number 3. Free aim spells and CC abilities. Every ability that doesn't attack one specific enemy directly has to be used with a circle or a cone, indicating where the attack will land. These attacks unfortunately still lock on to targets. To have some more freedom while doing this, hold the shift key, making sure the attack doesn't try and lock itself to the enemy closest to the indicator. Number 4. Using abilities just because they're available. We also kind of touched upon this in the Origins video, but even though every class now has a plethora of abilities, doesn't mean you should use all of them just because they're available. It would be smarter to save things like Rush and Pommel Strike for whenever someone or something is building up a huge attack or spell, so that you can use it to interrupt their attack. Truth be told, interrupting is the entire name of the game here. Number 5. Fast travel even faster. As you might have noticed, walking speed is still terribly slow. If you can't be bothered to walk all the way to the edge of an area to leave it, just enter a building or a home, turn around, and immediately leave again. It now teleports you to the fast travel menu that normally would only open up when reaching an area via the intended spots on the map. Beware though, even on the SSD the game loads pretty slow, so if your PC is in top tier or at least on a decent level, it may be a better idea to avoid loading screens as much as possible. Number 6. Create choke points. If a battle proves too tough, re-evaluate. Take a step back and find a small corridor or hallway in which you can hold your position. 
make sure every enemy can only come to you via one way, and press the H key on your keyboard. This will make everyone hold their ground, without having to micromanage the AI who loves to run all over the place and draw attention from random enemies towards them. You can also create these during combat, just control plus A your entire party and pull them away to a safer spot. Unlike Origins, hitboxes actually work in this game, so running away for a little bit actually benefits you, especially with how fast your party moves. Dragon Age 2 uses a lot of the same streets, same dungeons and same sewers over and over again, all constructed to have tiny corridors and hallways. Might as well use them to your advantage, right? Number 7. Don't focus on map markers too much. Kirkwall is alive. Ish. It's self-explanatory to just follow the minimap everywhere, however, sometimes standing around or listening to random dialogue in the streets opens up new quests or dialogue. It's nothing major, but a bit of extra gameplay never heard. And honestly, there you have it. Everything has changed compared to Origins and what is, in my opinion, worth knowing or doing something with. At least the basics, that is. But then again, Dragon Age 2 isn't a very fleshed out game. If you thought Origins was punishing and hard, you'll have a much easier time with Dragon Age 2. Overall, in my opinion at least, the story and characters are the reason you'll be playing this one. So don't feel too overwhelmed by the gameplay changes and numbers flying across the screen as they don't mean as much as they did in Origins. If anybody cares, yeah, I personally think Dragon Age 2 could have been a lot better. But hey, it is what it is, with how EA crunched Bioware to release the game in the sorry state it did. It's nowhere near bad, please don't get me wrong, but it could have at least come a lot closer to the masterpiece that Origins was. If you have any questions or remarks, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And other than that, thanks for watching, and have fun with your playthrough.